voice. I would like to welcome everyone to this lecture by one of our most illustrious alumni. I'm not going to tell you anything about her because Roger Solomon is going to introduce her. Uh, but, uh, but I would just say one of our most illustrious alumni, Professor Sid Smith, who's the president of the MLA. This is co-sponsored by Baker Nord and also by the Friends of English. Thank you, Shelley. Um, Roger Solomon and you know, may, may I call Roger Solomon um, our, our beloved emeritus professor? Yeah. <laughs> so Roger Solomon, who worked with Sid when she was here um, getting her PhD, is going to introduce Sid Smith. And he'll do a much better job than I ever could because he has this long uh, like working and professional relationship with her. So, Roger? Autobiography, 
1974, A Poetic of Women's Autobiography, Marginality, Marginality and Fictions of Self and Representations, 1987, Subjectivity, Identity, and the Body, Women's Autobiographical Practices in the 20th Century, 1993, and many other books, uh, I need hardly add, essays and reviews edited or co-authored, including incidentally, and I don't want to um, uh, omit this, uh, including uh, co-edited with uh, Julia Watson of Ohio State, The Important Reading Autobiography, A Guide to Interpreting Life Narrative of 2001, recently reissued, and I believe being sold right outside the door, uh, by the Minnesota Press. This book, 10 years old, has had an enormous influence, as you might imagine, on a whole generation of students. Our speaker tonight has taught at the University of Arizona, at Binghamton, 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 let me try that again, and presently she's at the University of Michigan. She was chair at Michigan from 2003 to 2009. She's the Martha Gernsley Colby Collegiate Professor of English and American Studies. And of course she's presently the present president of the uh, Modern Language Association. Her topic tonight is America's Exhibit A, Hillary Rodham Clinton's Living History and the Genres of Authenticity. I'm proud and pleased to introduce Professor Sidney Smith. Career that's been lived in the humanities. 
In my family, there are two people with doctorates from Case, one in English and the other, my brothers, in physics. The Smiths of Bay Village, Ohio. I won't go into that. <laughs> are attached to this place in Cleveland, where we grew up. And so to the members of the English department, to Roger and Betty, and to this institution, I will always be indebted. Thank you. interest, and it is an academic presentation, but I think it's also accept, it's accessible to a general public. So, here we go, America's Exhibit A. As the old canard goes, a year is a millennium in politics, so what the candidate lineup will look like in 2016 is far from predictable. But for many politicos, the expectation is that Hillary Clinton will make a second run for the Democratic nomination and then for the White House. She will be 69 in 2016, not the oldest candidate. Ronald Reagan was 69 when he was elected. She'll have her experience as Secretary of State in the Obama administration, international bona fides and security credibility that expand her claims to formidable expertise. I gotta get uh, organized here, sorry. Um, oh, here's the, here's the lead into this. Does she have the stuff to come on hardball into the belly of the beast? Okay. <laughs> That's Chris <Christmas. laughs> um, Chances are she will have written another book, this one on foreign policy. Clinton's 2003 best-selling autobiography, Living History, will more than likely be reissued sometime before the campaign begins in earnest. It will probably enter the New York Times bestseller list for a second time. Given this possible future for Clinton's autobiography, I want to return to living history to meditate on the political uses of autobiography in the gendered arena of American presidential politics. Living history earned big bucks. Its audiobook version won an Emmy. The book tour, interviews, and reviews that followed put Clinton in contact with a national audience of celebrity fans and supporters, the citizenry of potential voters that the aspiring presidential candidate would, be, would recruit into what she calls Hillary Land. Translations of the book, including the Chinese version, turned her autobiography into global bestseller. As prologue to the campaign for the presidential nomination, Living History sought to do the social work of convincing the voting public that a woman could assume national leadership. Not that Hillary was the first woman to launch a presidential bid in the United States. <clears throat> Margaret Chase Smith was the first, uh, uh, who was a congresswoman and a senator from Maine, made a bid for the Republican nomination for the presidency in 1964. Some of you, some of us in this audience will remember that, losing out to Barry Goldwater. And Shirley Chisholm, congresswoman from the 12th district of New York, made a bid for the Democratic nomination, the first by an African American in 1972. But Clinton was the first former first lady to position herself for a presidential run, and the first woman with national and global name recognition and celebrity status to establish a viable plan for pursuing and gaining the nomination. The Hillary of living history then would translate celebrity aura into active support, skepticism into investment, and do so by performing a convincing political persona. But how would this woman, this feminist professional, former first lady, and elected senator craft the story of representative Americanness in the hyper-masculinized genre of the aspiring candidate's autobiography? And how? Would she perform the intimacy that secures the claim to authenticity in this highly mediated form? To ground this discussion, let me summarize the context in which candidate autobiography is produced and circulated. In the densely mediated environment of contemporary presidential campaigns, the political persona is ever more deftly and promiscuously imaged, voiced, choreographed, and networked. 
Central to the political utility of the persona is the life story, a performative occasion for legitimating power, wherever the actual politician may be at any particular moment. And much of it is spent in what the political scientist John R. Corner describes as the sphere of political institutions scripted through established roles and functions. The persona circulates through an ensemble of idiomatic effects across diverse contexts and interactions. The best-selling autobiography of the aspiring candidate circulates these idioms of political agency to a broad public and to, to decidedly strategic ends. The aspiring candidate wants to get a book written, get it out, get it read, and get it on the New York Times bestseller list. Its very shelf life registers its power to project electability and compel voter support. Through it, the candidate would fashion a viable political persona, compel the devoted following of the celebrity, and secure the symbolic relationship between the life story and the political system. He or she, that is, would project the political individual as an embodiment of representativity. Okay. It, in the first decades of the 21st century, memoir culture, celebrity culture, and presidential politics converge to convert a life into money, message, and conduit for affective attachment that circulates through what Lauren Roland defines as the intimate public sphere. How does the book of the life do its political work? Well, politician, ghostwriter, agent, and publisher collaborate to produce a book typically incorporating photographs, the iconic images condensing the arc of the life and fixing embodied images to the political persona. The implantment of the life story inserts the narrated I in a succession of events unfolding actions and relationships, projecting a kinetic narrative fable. The narrating eye functions as the voice of the politician, seeking to capture the ear of the other, the reader sitting at home in a coffee house on the beach. And in its address to the imagined interlocutor, the narrating eye promises to draw the reader into the promised zone of familiarity, identification, and affective attachment. This is the performative relationality of autobiographical narration. Iconic, oral, kinetic, and performative uh, dimensions of autobiographical narration are mobilized in campaign autobiographies to project a believable or sincere political persona. But exactly how is authenticity produced in this most utilitarian form? Autobiographical discourse itself promises a kind of authenticity consolidating the intimacy of the first person witness voice. The very act of holding the story in one, one's hands and of listening to the voice of the politician for some overcomes, if only for a moment, the sense of remoteness between <coughs> voter and candidate. But there are other metrics of authenticity effects. At the intersection of the idiosyncratically personal history and shared communal discourses, Generic intelligibility, by which I mean a species or template of storytelling that is recognizable to an audience, is certainly one of the most important in producing authenticity effects. For the political candidate, generic intelligibility attaches authenticity and sincerity to the story about being American. Since the candidate has to embody the American story to convince the public to imagine him or her in the White House, the aspiring candidate renders citizenship intelligible through the intimate address of autobiographical narration. And it is to the authenticity effects of generic intelligibility in Clinton's living history that I now turn. <coughs> now, there are many aspects of living history that seem unrelievably, unrelievably instrumental and thus inauthentic its carefully controlled voice, its pandering to the myths of American identity and patriotism, its self-serving defense of the Clinton presidency, its cronyism in naming functionaries, luminaries, and acolytes, and more. And while the fact that it is ghostwritten certainly does not surprise, of course, ghostwriting has long been an aspect of presidential memoirs, 
Clinton names three contributors to the book in her half afterward. And this kind of ghostwriting exposes kind of the postmodern bureaucratization of the candidacy, its standardization, packaging, and test marketing. From one point of view, then, living history gives us a corporately produced full authenticity of the test marketed Hillary, the prized political commodity of contemporary political cultures. But that doesn't get at what is really interesting about living history, at least interesting to me, um, and how it projects a viable political persona. What is fundamentally at stake in this book that would launch a thousand voters is how to find the right story to tell, how to mobilize genre to do the social work of launching a presidential bid by a feminist woman. How would this aspiring feminist candidate project for the people what Dan Nelson describes as critical to producing the aura of constitutional presidentialism? That is a, quote, concentrated and purified experience of representation in the executive body of the president, the concrete correlative of national manhood. Actually, living history mobilizes a constellation of genres and autobiographical discourses, all of which produce their different authenticity effects, effects that project a real Hillary. In following the diverse strands, strands and entanglements, <clears throat> excuse me, in following the diverse strands and entanglements of the genres, we begin to understand how the published autobiography produces or not the authenticity effect of what might be called a real Hillary the convincing persona that is always at stake in the political field. So let's consider how living history mobilizes its real history through something like six different genres. Modernist Bildungs Roman, Feminist Bildungs Roman, First Lady Memoir, Buddy Narrative, Celebrity Confession, and War Memoir. Along the way, we'll see that the authenticity effects of these generic modes in action are often contradictory and compete. So let's go at this. Buildings Roman, I, I, I've paired the two of them together. So this is Buildings Roman and Feminist Buildings Roman. Living history seems a robustly modernist autobiography, characterized by its retrospective narrative trajectory, its developmental autonomous narrative eye, and its narrative grammar of modernity as a telos of freedom and progress. In this, it reproduces a highly intelligible mode of political memoir um, that, uh, in which um, individualized narrators use kind of linearity and a realistic mode to recount their lives and to suggest that their selves cohere into a coherent narrative. Indeed, li living history can be read as a coming of age story of education, <coughs> maturation, and a journey of subjective incorporation as a kind of normative national subject. The first paragraph of living history announces the trope of this national subject. I wasn't born a first lady or a senator. I wasn't born a Democrat. I wasn't born a lawyer or an advocate for women's rights and human rights. I wasn't born a wife or mother. I was born an American in the middle of the 20th century, a fortunate time and place. Living history produces what Joseph Slaughter describes in another context as a kind of tautological, teleological structure of buildings romance. That is, it situates the human personality both before and after the process of incorporation. The narrating eye of the autobiography is the elected senator who tells a story of becoming what she already was from the beginning. <laughs> As such, the narrator acts as a guarantee, guarantor of the first lady's enfranchisement as a bona fide and electable candidate. The building's Roman form here reproduces the realness norms naturalizing American national identity. Through the performative act of life writing, the narrating eye of living history registers the characterological features of modernist subjectivity 
among them free will, intelligence, mastery, entrepreneurial autonomy, and ambition. This reiteration of the national fable of individualism <clears throat> secures the symbolic relationship between person and nation. As Philip Holden observes, the social action of modernist self-narrating involves projecting the legitimacy of power by suturing the story of the individual to the story of the nation, projecting as it does so the coherence of both the national subject and the nation. Yet, as he also observes, the modernist autobiography of the political leader has been a masculinist mode of the building's roman, conjoining the phallic agent of narration, the linearity of progressive time, and the symbolic narrated I. The realness norms producing the authenticity effect of American identity for this aspiring presidential candidate are effects of the masculinist tropes of phallic leadership. In this light, let's return to the opening paragraph and reread the next sentences. I was free to make choices unavailable to past generations of women in my own country and inconceivable to many women in the world today. I came of age on the crest of tumultuous social change and took part in the political battles fought for the meaning of America and its role in the world. Here the narrator positions herself in a history that uh, Lauren Berlant suggests um, is about the crisis of the national narrative. That is, that the it's an uh, it's an as yet realized um, uh, uh, embodiment of the abstract principles of, of democracy. So here emerges a second generic mode. The narrated Hillary of liberal history is routed through the genre of feminist Bildungsroman. The arrival in the Senate seat for the former first lady is the culmination of the feminist fable of the struggle for full citizenship. We observe the voice and form of feminist buildings Roman, um, excuse me, when the narrator tells us what it was like to be a woman in the Seven Sisters College, in the anti-war movement, in law school, in the campaign, in the governor's mansion, in the law firm, in the White House, and on the senatorial campaign trail. We hear it also when she parses her discomforts with gendered roles her negotiations of gender bias, and her analysis of gender ideology and action. This Hillary positions herself as a generational symbol, America's Exhibit A, the embodiment of the future of America's second wave feminism and of America itself. The Feminist Buildings Roman produces its authenticity effects by condensing the Ur story of second wave feminism. Clinton's narrator, narrative is the generational autobiography of women fighting for equality in the workplace and in national politics. In a world, despite formidable obstacles, accumulating success and power as entrepreneurial feminists, projecting themselves as individualist agents of change. Its claim to authenticity is an effect excuse me, of its triumphalist plot of achievement against the odds, and its tacit acknowledgment that most women have to work far harder than men to get respect, that they cannot just be charismatic political personalities. So America's Exhibit A in the Feminist Buildings Roman reiterates the individualist plot of development and possessive masculinity of liberal feminism at the same time that she keeps in play the feminist critique of normative masculine national identity. Okay, so that's Buildings for Man and Feminist Buildings for Man. Now, First Lady Memoir and Buddy Narrative. <laughs> Living history also has to be read as a First Lady Memoir, Clinton's co contribution to an intractably gendered tradition in American political life. This genre is by definition a narrative of a gendered role, of heteronormative coupling, feminine subject positions, and feminized fables of identity that attach both the narrating and narrated I to another, the husband, whose history as president compels the wife's version as the summation of her identity. It is a genre out of women's culture, identified with affect and mission. As such, it is a genre that reproduces the gendered privatization of politics. It is also a haunted genre, 
inflected as it is by the cultural anxieties surrounding the role itself, a non-elective, non-constitutional post that troubles the notion of legitimate power in a representative democracy. The role of the first lady in what might be called the first heteronormative relation is a role without a warrant. Or rather, its warrant is to maintain the integrity of the zone of presidential politics as phallic ground, as a masculinist zone. Hillary Clinton was not the first activist and politically savvy advisor in the role. Merely recall Eleanor Roosevelt and Lady Bird Johnson, for instance. She was, however, the first avowedly feminist in the White House, and her version of the genre is one of role discomfort of the 1992 presidential campaign. Here's the back cover. So uh, it's a back cover of photographs that collectively produce this role of a kind of this gendered femininity um, and gendered role. OK, really, uh, of the 1992 presidential campaign, the narrating I observes, I had worked full time during my marriage to Bill and valued the independence and identity that were provided. Now I was solely the wife, an odd experience for me. In telling the story of this gendered role, which she describes as an ideal and largely mythical concept of American womanhood, the narrator of living history interrupts the grammar of liberal feminist Bildnitz Roman. In this mode, the narrator tells of constant failure, failure either to fit or to escape this sentimental role's ambit. Nor can she escape suspicions of political illegitimacy. Clinton's narrative becomes one of role objection. It exposes the way in which she is an inappropriate subject, an ambitious, excessive subject, who cannot contain herself within normatively feminized role boundaries. To manage the political persona of the woman who would be president, the narrator of living history reconfigures the first lady memoir as a buddy narrative of the first partnership. <laughs> Through the buddy narrative, the narrator shifts from the subject position of the sentimentalized wife to the subject position of a sidekick. This is living history's fourth generic mode. Now, Bill and Hillary Clinton presented themselves to the nation as the first buddy ship. And of course, it's interesting <laughs> that they named their White House dog Buddy. <laughs> when they arrived at the White House, and during the eight years in residence, the Clintons packaged their relationship to the American public as a working relationship and a new kind of first marriage. A dual career marriage in the White House required media management because it's so predictably drew fire for its rescripting and disruption of gender roles and affects. Clinton wore her pantsuits. Bill emoted for the public and the electorate. <laughs> Bill and Hillary, as a presidential pa package deal, confused the norms of the first couple's heteronormativity in ways that unsettled public-private boundaries, that unsettled the idioms of a kind of patriarchally organized relations, and the gendered politics of leadership. In the first buddy ship, affect and agency became fungible, fungible features of presidential leadership. This, fund, this fungibility um, persists in the rhetorical moves of Clinton's living history. The narrating eye of the first professional managerial couple places herself at the center of presidential politics, as in this passage, where she bemoans the failure of the Clinton health care initiative. Now just listen, this is so wonderful. Someday we will fix the system. When we do, it will be the result of more than 50 years of efforts by Harry Truman, Richard Nixon, Jimmy Carter, and Bill and me. <laughs> yes, I'm still glad we tried. The slippage of the initial we of the American people as a kind of collective to the second we of Bill and me registers Clinton's self-figuration as co-president during the Clinton years. Consider as well the passage where she tells of the presidential, presidential visit to Jordan and Israel in October of 1994. Quote, heading back home, I believed I was leaving Israel another step closer to peace and security. End quote. In such rhetorical gestures, 
the narrator of living history inserts herself rhetorically in the subject position of co-equal partner in the phallic arena of presidential leadership. The narrator of living history mobilizes the power of rhetoric to intimate that she has already been a real president, already inhabited the subject position, and exercised the phallic leadership attached the, the phallic leadership attached to political leadership in reality and in the pronouns of narration. This, we might argue, is authenticity by pronomial location. <laughs> been there, done that, already been a real president. Okay, now I want to talk about celebrity confession and war memoir. Um, written in the wake of the president's very public adultery, Living History is dogged by Bill Clinton's sex acts. <laughs> With the publication of the Star Report in 1998, the president's privates, as Lauren Grass notes, had become, quote, the vital center of public discussion <laughs> in the United States and the world. <laughs> and she goes on to say, this repeated thrusting of the pornographic <laughs> penis into a public realm organized around the symbolic phallus indicates a crisis in the patriarchal structure of authority that is traditionally undergirded the American public sphere, end quote. Hillary Clinton's intimacy with the president's privates became a public affair in all senses of the word. That spectacular scandal had consumed the celebrity tabloids as well as national news media. Indeed, the coverage of the scandal, the Star Report, and the impeachment turned the mainstream news organizations into touts for pornographic representations and pleasures, moral outrage, and crusader zeal. Reviews of the book indicate that for many, finding out what Hillary would say and how she would say it drove readers to purchase and consume living history. The public had watched the first soap opera, lived through its high drama, a drama that turned male politicians into moral hysterics. The public pundits and politicos had struggled to script, to script Hillary's reaction, her predicament, and her emotions, parsing every gesture, every look, every behavior, every straight statement that she made. In its remediations of Hillary's predicament and response, her celebrity, initially attached to her position as first lady, intensified. With the publication of her story, readers hoped for the first-hand account of what Hillary really felt about her husband's philandering and her own public humiliation. Readers and reviewers read, that is, for a mode of celebrity confession, the revelation of the gritty details of betrayal, humiliation, and rage. The narrator of living history might have both mobilized more sympathy by playing to the tropes of celebrity confession, emoting for the public nurtured on narratives of debasement, personal pain, and overwrought emotion. But to manage authenticity through the performance of this script, to take up this subject position of the wronged wife, would be to keep Bill's penis in the story, and with it, the identification of political leadership with the phallus. Moreover, to succumb to the reader's desire for intimate details of unhappiness, rage, shame, and humiliation would be to depoliticize Hillary as a presidential aspirant to keep her in her place, the place of the wounded part. The Hillary of living history manages the history of humiliation by refusing to shift into the generic mode of confession. She refuses the narrative of individualizing and privatizing sentimentality with its promise of titillation and the pleasures attached to witnessing another's debasement. She says next to nothing about how it felt to endure her husband's philandering and its aftermath, and this is about what she says. Instead, the reader observes the performance of stoic self-discipline. As the narrator keeps the wronged wife subject position in abeyance, and the generic mode here is war memoir. Throughout living history, the narrating eye claims the stance of the subject under assault. But the assaults are not inflicted by a philandering husband, and the perpetrator is not Bill Clinton. Wrongs are wrought by political opponents, and the perpetrator is the Republican Party. 
and the media. In other words, the narrator displaces the mode of confession with its allure of intimate revelation onto a survivor narrative, a public genre mobilized for the collective action of reducing wrongs and the wrongs of rights denied. The narrator herself as ha represents herself as having survived the assault on everything that she ever did. The assault on her past, the assault on her character, the assault on her gendered humanity as insufficiently maternal, insufficiently feeling, giving, given to irrational anger. In the discourse of Clinton's war memoirs, the terms of reference are enemies, battles, and victories. This was all-out political war, the narrator says of True Brigade. In the chapter, to, chapter entitled Soldiering On, she describes wearing armor that thickened over the years. Quote, we soon learned that nothing was off limits in this war and that the other side was far better armed with the tools of political battle. Through generic adaptability, the domestic battle of the sexes of heterosexual coupling becomes a national battle between the right and the left, the Republican de and Democratic agenda for the nation. In eschewing celebrity confession and mobilizing warrior discourse to ground the narrative grammar of the survivor story, Clinton's narrator inhabits the subject position of the battle-scarred woman warrior and rehearses the idioms of muscular masculinity associated with presidential power. As first lady, she didn't have her finger on the button, she hadn't ordered the armed forces to the field, but she mobilizes the discourse of warfare as a proxy for performing the defining acts of a presidency. She provides evidence to her reader that she can exercise the masculine discipline of failing leadership. The real Hillary in this script is not the emoting, debased wife. The presidential aspirant is not looking to secure the bond with her public and potential voters around domesticated pain and suffering. She is looking to secure a bond around the figure of the warrior, stoical and single-minded, who soldiers on and fights for the country as an agent of the nation's muscular defense. The survivor hones the hard presidential body, promising the electorate protection, safety, and ruthless firm certitude. So, how to be Hillary? The case of Hillary Clinton's living history and its management of being American captures what's at stake in the political arena for a feminist who would be president. Buildings Roman, Feminist Buildings Roman, First Lady Memoir, Buddy Narrative, Celebrity Confession War Memoir, the heterogeneous, sometimes conflicting genres of life writing organizing this utilitarian project expose the difficulty of successfully managing political and politicized gender through masculinized and feminized versions of genre. It takes a village of genres to make an <laughs> For the aspiring candidate, the genre of feminist buildings roman secures the realness norms of American political identity, the joint person and nation. Among them, as I noted, the characterological features of American individualism and the universalized figure of national belonging. Yet the mobilization of feminist buildings roman has two countervailing effects. It exposes the realness norms of modern stock autobiography as masculinist norms, and it scripts the normative narrative that is the nation's privileged fable of American political identity of its gendered features. Doing so, it would remake the nation as more fully inclusive, women's citizenship as full rather than partial, and Hillary as a real candidate. But even as living history presents a paradigmatic case of the legacies of 1970s liberal feminist discourse, two specters haunt the grammar of the feminist buildings roman. First is the, expector, is the specter of what Rush Limbaugh calls a feminazi. The woman too strident, humorless, power hungry, and threatening to elect to lead the nation. This alternative version of the real history had long circulated in hostile media that portrayed her as a lying, cold-hearted bitch, a scandalous person. We sense this ghost every time the narrator makes a joke and pokes fun at herself. Now second is the specter of the feminist who failed to assert her agency to sever a relationship that had been the source of betrayal and public humility. 
I mean, public humiliation. The first specter, the feminazi, is a specter of too much feminism. The second is a specter of too little feminism. And the contradiction that's set in motion by her mobilization of these different genres undermines Clinton's claim to the authenticity of either her femininity or her feminism. The negotiations of the First Lady memoir also fail to produce a determinant ground upon which to authenticate her, personal, political, her political persona. In political terms, this is a genre and an abject sub subject position from which Clinton must extract herself is, if she is to position herself for a run for the presidency. Um, so, but on the one hand, the First Lady memoir tracks the story of romance, marriage, motherhood, and service to her husband and to her country, um, and to her country. She performs the woman who stands by her husband, protecting his story. But the narrative of role objection, of being unhappy in that role, reproduces the portrait of a woman who is clumsily or uncomfortably feminized, as the serial recourse and references to unsuccessful hairstyles metonymically suggest. She's always talking about not finding the right hairstyle. <laughs> <coughs> So she reproduces, in the uh, First Lady memoir, she reproduces the realness norms of femininity, but she also undercuts them with her sense of uh, being in this abject role. Now, the insertion of herself in the subject position of co-president in her version of the budding narrative leaves Clinton open to charges of unseemly and opportunistic self-aggrandizement. Um, excuse me. And this is demonstrated by the attacks on her credibility by Republicans. Among them, if any of you read this, Dick Morris's um, book called Rewriting History. Featured on its cover is a cut-up of Clinton. Her mouth in close-up appears on the top half, and her eyes in close-up on the bottom half. The mouth signifies on multiple levels as a danger zone or sprung, sprung trap of authenticity's appearance, as a site of female seduction, as the other feminine mouth she didn't have, the brightly soft one of Monica, as the origin of lying and subterfuge as a tooth vagina. The mismatch pathologizes Clinton as an untrustworthy congenital liar and demonizes her as a monstrous woman, at once too feminine in her wiliness and not feminine enough in her lack of sexual attraction. The dismembered Hillary here becomes the personification of scandal, the scandal of illegitimate, corrupting power whose name is woman. It isn't that just that Hillary Clinton lived through a scandal. It is that she is a scandal. But it is not only her frenzied antagonists who made <coughs> trouble for her buddy story. The buddy did as well. <laughs> Bill Clinton penned his own presidential memoir and when my life appeared in 2004, now he dutifully delayed it for one year until hers had been out, his life story only energized opposition research. Now Hillary detractors could use his history to reinforce their claims of her self-serving fabrication. The book to retrieve his presidency and himself from the scandals of the Clinton years effectively marginalized his wife's book and undermined the credibility of her claims to the first buddyship, as it was bound to do. And this is Bill's, the back cover for Bill's book. You can see Hillary's kind of only in there once, and it's all about, you know, kind of the narcissistic adulation of Bill himself. In a certain way, Bill's narrative puts Hillary back in place and reminds the public that he will not go gently. The former first buddy will not be buddied up. In one more way, she comes across as overreaching and unbelievable. Then there is the effect of managing public humiliation of the Lewinsky scandal by eschewing uh, the confessional mode. Um, uh, in the dramas of celebrities that are fully sexualized and centralized, you know, the kind of celebrity dramas are about the realm of sexuality and sexualized beings. And um, they appear in public as kind of untouchable icons of libidinal attraction. 
protecting her privacy by refusing this narrative, by refusing the subject position of a sexualized celebrity icon, the narrator reinforces the media images and rep representations her of her uh, as a kind of non-sexual woman, or rather as too manly and self-controlled to be a sexualized woman. Further, the aural signature of the political, uh, of the political persona, the, the war memoir persona, produces a flatness of affect that belies the generic avowal of sincerity and confessional truth-telling. And the rhetoric of bellicosity deployed in the performance of self-command undermines this, the intimacy of an intersubjective relationship between Hillary, the narrator, and her reader. For the woman who would be president, the competing demands um, of what uh, Dana Nelson calls this hard body and the soft body of presidential leadership cannot be so easily negotiated. On the one hand, the political persona can appear too feminine to be president. On the other, she can appear too masculine to be president. So um, all six genres of life writing promise some grounds of authenticity upon which the candidate Hillary can project her electability. Um, and for the and she needs to have, she needs to produce this notion of a kind of real Hillary, a unified subject, um, because that's what's needed for the effective political persona. Um, and Hillary, the Hillary of living history, would perform that. If you look at this, the iconic image on the front of the cover certainly tries to do its paratextual work in that direction, to give a sense of a consolidated uh, uh, subject, one who's a unified image, a real, self-knowing, self-sufficient subject. But you can't always read a book by its cover. In the contradiction, the contradiction set in motion through the autobiography um, by the cacophony of genres exposes the restlessness of subject positions these genres would fix and the unity of the political persona, that is the Hillary, that she would consolidate for her reader. The subject positions, American individualist, second wave feminist, first lady, buddy, wrong woman, war hurt hero. The gendered identities, feminine, feminist, phallic, queer, a kind of queering of them, neither one nor the other. The restlessness of the generic modes also opens up the suspicion that it is impossible to locate the real Hillary and any ground of authenticity to the political persona except the exhibit A of ambition, and thus the public ju judgments, too much femininity, too little femininity, too much feminism, too little feminism, too much mu muscular masculinity, too little phallic authority, too hot-tempered, too coldly calculating, too soft, too hard, too indeterminate. In the realm of politics, where the currency is the production of a real self, living history seems to give us instead a kind of refractory postmodern surface. Now, this kind of um, attempt to produce a viable political uh, persona will probably continue, um, especially if or when Hillary Clinton makes another run for the presidential nomination in, 19, in 2016. As I noted in the opening, probably Clinton will have written another book. The narrator of this next book, who will be the former, uh, could be a sitting over the former Secretary of State, will also be a corporately produced persona of a would-be president. But the question is, what will the next book be? What will it do? And what will be the grounds of authenticating a real Hillary? Thank you. We love you, Hillary, and why don't you get a different hairdo? <laughs> <laughs>
I'll take, I don't know whether you usually do questions, but I'll be glad to take them. I mean, and it is, it is late, um, but um, if, you, if anybody wants to ask a question or comment on it. Yeah. Um, it seems to me there's another sort of ghost story that that book is battling with, and, that, and that's um, TV. I mean, mm -hmm. TV is a weird thing where the subject is autobiographical and is treated as a biographical subject yes. simultaneously. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how the book was sort of confronting this kind of uh, pre-existing history of her that she has to, uh, you know, endorse parts of, reject parts of, rewrite in, in uh, a book form when the powerful medium in our culture is that, that visual medium that she's, you know, being constantly exposed to. Well, you're absolutely right, and of course, um, uh, all of the ghosts that haunt this are the ghosts of the the, the Hillarys constructed by the media. Um, whether you're a Hillary, whether you were a Hillary supporter or a Hillary detractor. Now, the thing about a, the a, a book is that it's not just the publication of the book; it's all of the stuff that goes around it. So it's covered on TV. She's interviewed on TV. She goes from uh, book signing to book signing. She's covered in the local media at, as the book signing, uh, to the degree that she has a lot of um, uh, Hillary um, fans at the book signing. It produces this um, uh, kind of buzz around her as um, uh, as a potential candidate. So I think she, and, and then it's, um, it's uh, translated into other languages and then it's play elsewhere around the world. So there's a way in which um, the, the book, it, it's the book, it's the on, book ensemble, it's the book, it's everything that goes around publishing a book and using that as a way to meet, to meet the public. But you can, but, but, it, the, the thing about it is, and it's not actually, it's not a very interesting read as a book. Um, uh, it's very uh, functional in a way. But you see, you can see how her ghostwriters, I mean, she has these ghostwriters. She, she, I'm sure she um, uh, taped some of this and then also uh, kind of <coughs> did some of the editing and decided that this was acceptable as a presentation. You can see how they're um, constantly trying to um, both counter the media, um, and that's that kind of the war memoir mode, counter that, um, put out your story, um, uh, challenge the, the ways in which you've been presented in the media, but also kind of seduce the media or get them to um, uh, have a, another shot at the media about her qualifications um, uh, because she had to shift from the first lady mode to a, a mode that would present her qualifications as a real potential candidate. Um, so, uh, and I mean, we saw the problems with the media all the way through the, the primary season. Um, It'll be interesting to see, given the, given what's happened with the number of women who have become political celebrities now, how that, if she makes another run, and I suspect she will. I mean, I, I think she's going to make another run. I mean, I think it'll depend on what happens to Obama in 12. But she, she, she's not done yet. I don't think Hillary's done yet. Um, I think she wants to be the first woman president. Um, uh, and she's, she circulates in a slightly different way now as Secretary of State. There's a kind of aura around her uh, of competency that people are conceding even on the right. So she's had a performative arena in which to produce a counter-narrative to the narratives that the legacies of those narratives from the 1990s and early um, 2000s. Yeah, the, I actually wanted to ask about that, the, the role of Secretary of State, that it has always struck me as rather interesting. Uh, very strong Hillary supporters, of course, very disappointed 
when Obama did not pick her as yeah. you know, vice presidential candidate. And there's still lots of murmurings, right, about will Joe Biden step down in you know, 2012 with Hillary take right. the job, right, of vice president, right? And I'm wondering if you could fit those two different positions, right, into either the genres that you've invoked, right, or other ones. Because it has always seemed to me that despite the fact that the job of vice president uh, you know, th that person takes on the mantle, right, of, you know, the next presidential candidate inherits that position. Mm -hmm. uh, it's always struck me as a position that is so similar to that to of the first, first lady, lady, right? Uh, and that the Secretary of State, right, is so much more, it seemed, would seem to me, in the genre of maybe the war memoir. That was the only one of yes. those that I could really see yes. as connecting to it, right? Do you see, I I'm not actually really to comment yeah, 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 on whether yeah. she would take that position or not, yeah, yeah. but do you, can you fit those into either new or existing uh, genres for her that would you know, make it preferable, I would think, to stay in the genre of perhaps the war bomber or whatever we would add in Secretary of State rather than that of First Lady's Vice President? I mean, I've heard, you know, I've heard people say that that's what they think that move is going to be, to talk about Biden, um, you know, the rumblings about Biden being uh, uh, Stepping down as uh, the vice president, not not during this term, but uh, when Obama runs again, uh, to make way for Hillary. Um, I, I think you're right about the 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 vice presidential role filled by a woman would invoke a kind of uh, uh, first vice presidential candidate lady, um, although. Going there via the route of Secretary of State will would mediate that, um, the, and and um, that'll be very. I do think she's going to write another book. It'll be very interesting to see what it will be. I think it will be about international politics, mm -hmm. and it'll about, be about the role of the United States in the next two decades. Um, and that's another way in which I mean that's the book that then will get on the bestseller list. And that'll be, a, that's a, a kind of, that's a, a kind of uh, genre of uh, competence and of uh, a broad um, kind of global vision and away from the personalized, you know, away from the personalized. Um, I, there is another uh, uh, memoir that's out there now and uh, I think it's doing the work and that's Condoleezza Rice's um, uh, apparently, it's going to be a two-volume. People are talking about whether she's getting ready to make a run for the uh, presidential nomination, and uh, for the Republicans, uh, uh, it, it's the right moment for her to get this book out. It's very interesting, and she's on the hosting. She's been on all the public media. That's her name is now out there. She kind of disappeared for a while, but now it's out there. And um, uh, very interesting to think about uh, about the you know kind of placing this autobiography at this certain moment, getting ready. Yeah, I, I this question is as much political as it is yeah. literary. But uh, I was thinking about the other women who are now prominent mm -hmm. in politics, mm -hmm. whose biographies, whose, whose life stories are so different from Hillary's, mm -hmm. and, and, and you think about what she has done to, to authenticize her, her story. What about all these others? And I mean, you know, Christine O'Donnell, um, the, the woman, <laughs> the <laughs> woman, Taylor Taylor woman in Taylor South Taylor Carolina, Taylor. Sarah, 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 Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, people like that, that throws, that, that throws all kinds of monkey wrenches mm -hmm. into, the, into the, the concept of authenticity. Mm -hmm. So where, where did you go with that? Well, I mean, it's very interesting. That it, Palin has Palin had her. Well, first there was a book while she was president that was put, up, was put out of her her speeches or something. It's writings by Sarah Palin Governor, that came out during the election. Governor. She hasn't been president. Yet. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you want that on the record? There. Yes. <laughs> That's right. Governor. Governor. Um, <laughs> In her president, in the vice presidential uh, uh, bid, um, uh, you know, that's a whole other. This is this question about you know uh, the the right production of the, the rights production of a certain kind of femininity, 
um, of a, a um, fighting femininity, the kind of grizzly bear femininity. Um, uh, but also, you know, with hers, I didn't read it. I mean, I was going to do a longer project on political memoirs, but they're so boring to read that, <laughs> that I thought life was too short and I didn't want to spend a couple years reading them. Um, and what, but so I read the reviews of them, <laughs> so then I can speak about them with great authority. Um, uh, but um, the thing about Palin's, everybody, all the commentators, and Frank Rich did a fabulous piece on it, um, uh, that what you see in that is the desire just to be a celebrity. I mean, and the, and the, fa the, the fascination with celebrity. I mean, this is, this is the whole other thing that we, that we have to think about is how is celebrity produced now? <laughs> How, how is it that we can produce candidates that are only media constructions? Um, which is what's happening with a lot of the younger, uh, 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 up and coming generation of women political figures. Yes? I enjoyed your, your talk very much. And uh, one of the things that fascinated me about it was this look at Clinton's uh, autobiography as a kind of paradigm for uh, a successful woman politician. But when, we, when one starts to talk about paradigms, uh, especially in the literary context, one is motivated to think about archetypes. And the archetypes for a, a powerful woman in literature are not very good. Uh, if, we think, if we go back to the sort of or paradigm of a, a woman who uh, takes the prerogatives of men, we might think of Clytemnestra, <laughs> going back to Homer, and uh, seeing this image recreated in Aeschylus. It, it, and inevitably ends up badly with the woman behaving like a man, uh, taking a man's power, usually ending up dead. Mm -hmm. uh, we can also think about Lady Macbeth. And in fact, uh, back in the 90s, uh, I remember a colleague once calling Hillary Clinton Lady mm -hmm. Macbeth. Yes, yes, yes. So uh, the, the question is, uh, how, with this paradigm in mind, these paradigms in mind, uh, how might she change the paradigm? Uh, would it be by changing the icon she uses? You, you used several times, three times in your talk, the same picture of her. Is there an image uh, that's even nonverbal that she could use to mitigate this uh, view of herself? Well, um, uh, um, I think that, I mean, one of the things that happened in her senatorial campaign that there's been some really interesting work on by political, feminist political scientists is that Hillary did a good job of refiguring herself and being seen as more down to earth. Um, there was a lot made about her laughter, her laughing, her drinking. Do you remember that? Her drinking beer, the listening tour, remember, all the way through upstate New York. To become uh, less um, rem uh, remote. And that, I mean, it was totally, it, it's not totally scripted. <laughs> That's as much a corporate production as anything else, but it was a performance of a more, um, you know, uh, folksy Hillary. So, and I think what, ha what happened, and it served her well in that campaign, what happened in the, and you all have analyses of what happened in the uh, uh, primary uh, campaign is that um, Obama's rise through her, I think, and it was uh, it was hard to figure out how to be Hillary each time she was someplace. I mean, especially in the debates, how to be Hillary? What Hillary was she going to be? Um, and uh, you know, for a feminist who wants to be president, it's not an easy thing. Um, uh, the other women, the women on the right, run against feminism. Uh, they're anti-feminist. They're, you know, they're powerful women. They're anti-feminist. And so um, hers is a, it's a very difficult position to be in. Um, and, and, uh, but I think, you know, I, I think she might, <coughs> I think given the time and this, experience that she'll have in a different arena. She's outside of the constant media uh, factory. I mean, you know, she's, she's more 
pres uh, she's more presidential or secretary of state, whatever that <laughs> you know, whatever that is, uh, when she's imaged the public, and um, uh, she comes off as very um, uh, uh, knowledgeable and um, a powerful secretary of state. So I think that'll help uh, mediate. Um, all of that uh, kind of noise in the system about the strong women, woman, I mean, about the, 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 the frightening, the kind of Medusa figure, the frightening, powerful woman. Yeah. Could you say more about what you are referring to when you say authenticity yeah. in this comment? Yeah. Um, what I'm interested in, I, I, um, People talk a lot, when I, when I teach autobiographical narration to, say, undergraduates, they want to hold on to something called the real self. So when they're telling their stories, this is the story about the real self. So I'm particularly interested in what is it about autobiographical narratives that produce the illusion that you've gotten the real self because I don't believe in real self. But, um, uh, so there are metrics of authenticity. It's how we, what do we ascribe sincerity and authenticity to? And that's what I'm interested in here. And genre is one of the ways that we do that because through genres that we, if we, if we um, uh, uh, use, uh, tell our story in a generic form that everybody knows, that's culturally common to us, then we feel, ah, I know that story. That's a real story. That's how I would tell my story. This, this must be the real story. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm trying to, but the problem is there are a lot of different kinds of storytelling modes, and they all produce authenticity in a different way. Okay. Um, so that's why I became really interested. I'm, I'm very fascinated by uh, the effects that genres produce in everyday life, basically. That's why I'm so interested in autobiographical narration. Does that, does yes, that make sense? Thank you. Yeah. Martha? It's related. Um, it's the connection between the ghost writing, the, sort of, yes. sort of the, the heavy <coughs> ghost writing, and what you're talking about right here. So, yes. And these are, these are actually almost empirical questions. What do you know about her actual connection between the, right, this staff yeah. here that is that is creating these effects for her that she gets to adopt or reject or you know whatever at every given yeah. moment in the production of these of these objects. <coughs> I, I, I um, that's a very good question. Um, uh, I'm not trying to suggest that somehow there's a strategy session where people think, oh, what what genre should we produce <laughs> to produce this authenticity effect? She is telling, she and her ghostwriters are telling her story. It's that. You never tell your story outside the, the narrative modes that you know from your cultural surround. So what, what are they drawing on, kind of? Uh, and, and what does it mean, then, to um, talk, at, it, position herself as a woman warrior, which she does. And it's not, I, I don't think they went in on a certain day and said, well, we need to have a little more muscular masculinity in here. <laughs> I'm trying to convince people that I can be president. It's that that's the discourse through which she understood that part of her struggle. It was a war to her. And, but war means you've got warriors, which means you have certain kinds of subject positions. You have certain ways of thinking about yourself as a warrior. Um, uh, and of course, uh, uh, her ghost writers, and, and the ghost writing thing is a whole other you know, that's a whole other complicated thing with political memoir, because they're almost all ghostwritten, um, except there is this wonderful little bit, um, Dennis Kucinich. <laughs> Dennis Kucinich wrote his, and Obama, I mean, I, he'll, he'll probably have some ghostwriters now. I mean, he wrote Dreams of My Father himself, but that was not a political memoir at the time. He was, he probably, was thinking about it, but he wasn't there as a politician who then needed to, you know, 
just get this narrative out. <laughs> One of the most surprising things, and I didn't realize this, but that this may be my na naivety. Profiles and courage was ghostwritten. Everybody yeah. thinks that it, Ted Sorison wrote yeah. that, yeah. you know. But that was really, you know, what's what interested me about political memoir is at what point in the 20th century did candidates begin writing their autobiographical narratives or producing them before the election? Mm -hmm. Mostly. There were always campaign biographies, but mostly they were written after somebody was a president. But now, I mean, if you looked at in 2008, all every candidate had their, you know, McCain has four of them. He's the only one who puts his, uh, by the way, almost the only one who puts his uh, ghostwriter on the cover. I mean, it, it says it's written by these two people. Um, so ghostwriting is an interesting ghostwriting is an interesting thing. But there, I read a really interesting um, essay by a woman in Rhetoric who was talking about ghostwriting as a bureaucratized form of writing now. That every, you know, that ghostwriting is what is done. It's a it's the production of a certain kind of official done and official narratives. So um, anyway, I don't know how I got off on that, but. <laughs> But that's about the problem with, you know, how do you think about the ghost writing. Mm -hmm. Was there a question? Yeah. Betty. Well, what's so troubling about being authentic is you have to be inauthentic to be authentic. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, well, uh, and why is it that we want authenticity? Why is it that authenticity is the core in political realm? For us. Because it's tied to it's tied to something called trust, but it's also a, a, a form of modernity. It's it's a modernist formation, um, uh, uh, and um, so it's very interesting. I'm waiting for the time when political life nobody will worry about authenticity. It's all it's all you know. It's all produced. It's all photoshopped. Does, does it matter today? Does does it matter? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. If you read, I mean, if you talk to people about why they like particular politicians, look at the people. Um, people say about people, she's just like me. I mean, yeah. that's yeah. just like me. I mean, um, that's what Christine O'Donnell's just like yeah. you. I'm going to and Sarah Palin, I'm just a mom like you. People want authenticity. That's it, it, politicians pander to authenticity. Yeah. When, uh, probably everybody here knows it, but I certainly don't. She was raised Republican. When did she become a Democrat? Um, it was when she got, I think, in the when she went away to Smith. Wellesley. 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 Sorry for those of you who went to Smith. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it was when I think it was um, when she was in college. But I'm not sure. I can't remember. I I think it was she. I don't know in her book whether she says the right. You know, she doesn't make that an epiphonic moment in the text. Um, so I don't know. But she says she was a Goldwater. Right? Yes, she was a Goldwater. So it's '64, but she's five years. I mean, so uh, that was in high school. She was in high school when she was a Goldwater supporter. Somebody else? Yeah. Um, I'm interested uh, in uh, thinking about um, the, um, autobiography, the, the, the autobiography of the um, presidential aspirant as an unfinished narrative. Mm -hmm. And to what extent is its unfinished quality um, kind of a, a function of its effectiveness? Uh, I, I thought about this. Of its what? Of, 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 of its effectiveness. Effectiveness? Prime candidate. Um, well, I mean, all autobiography is unfinished. <laughs> you have to die. Um, well, it's all unfinished. Compared to, because it's interesting, the... Um, that wasn't fair, but <laughs> it, was my first, it was my first thought. Her book compared to Clinton's um, memoir, which is that genre of presidential memoir, which is this is what I'm writing after my presidency is over. It's kind of a closing up of the narrative of, of his presidency versus something like um, Obama's, which is building to 
you know, the actual, you know, um, campaign. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, people write narratives for all kinds of reasons. Um, uh, right now, a lot of people write them to make money because it's we're in a, you know kind of the memoir boom, boom the commodification, the kind of tremendous um, uh, commodification of life storytelling. But people write them. People write narratives in media's race. Even Bill Clinton is in media's race mm -hmm. now. His presidency is done, and he's trying to give it a spin. But he himself struggles in there to figure out. He, he tries to to give people a narrative that will explain to them why he screwed up. <laughs> um, but he, I, I don't. I I, I bet um, if you read that, you wouldn't necessarily feel he got come, he kind of did come to the end of that. I mean, his narrative is in the middle of that crisis in his presidency all the way through. So, so now it is the case that, um, uh, and, and, and after a presidency, memoirs are very instrumental as well. Now the interesting thing that I discovered, I was at a conference on, um, on uh, political memoir, presidential memoirs. They're often not very good sellers. They often go on to remainder tape. <laughs> um, uh, but they make a lot of money. Now, George Bush is are, are going to come out pretty soon, I think. They, they, and, and the Clintons had a big package. I think she got something like eight, mil, eight million, could be a 10, or she got 10 and he got 12, something like that. So, um, and probably most of that went to legal bills for, from the impeachment. Um, uh, to wipe that clean, so that she could begin to build up a, a, a you know, pay off the debt, so that she could get ready to run. Um, so they're all they're they're all doing something. Whether it's pr positioning yourself for a run or telling people why your presidency was great. I mean, not very many people kind of describe why it wasn't any good. Um, <laughs> the only, you know, the one that people talk about, of course, that's the best presidential memoir, it's Ulysses S. Grant's. Um, and he wrote them to support himself. I mean, that's the other thing. He wrote, you know, sometimes it's just to make money. I mean, to, to, to in earlier times, to uh, just have something to live on. Any other questions before we break up? Thank you. You've been a wonderful audience.